and Central Asia. From 2010 to 2011, including the period following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, Ms. Nashawait served as the Council on Foreign Relations Fellow in Japan, where she conducted energy and economic policy research evaluating U.S. and Asia energy policies. It's my distinct honor to invite my friend who traveled all the way from Washington, D.C. to us just for Sapo, Julia Nashuait. Um, so again, thank you, May, and, uh, and the organizers here at Zalpo. Uh, this is a, a terrific event, and I hope to see more of it. Um, before I get into my um, presentation here, which will focus mainly on um, energy, the energy dynamics, I want to make sure there has been ample discussion or some mention of where we are on TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so I, I'll just give you a little bit of an update. And for those who are not familiar with TPP, uh, real quickly, you know, when you think about the Asia-Pacific region and, of course, the U.S., this is a Pacific power. And as we look at, you know, the most dynamic place in the world where that's changing and that's growing, it's going to be in that, in that region. And therefore, it's been more and more of a, of a great need to try to promote uh, this partnership when you look at, you know, the largest economies of the world, uh, rapidly growing middle class, um, you have over half a billion consumers. Uh, and then looking at the trade negotiations, uh, you, you're looking at anywhere between 2.5 to 2.9 trillion dollars in 2013, and that continues to to grow. Also, when you think about some of the benefits of TPP and where we are, uh, we're looking at opportunities to provide safeguards for workers and the environment, um, w ensuring there's enforceable standards uh, with any type of trade agreement, of course. But there will be a lot of groundbreaking new commitments that will be announced that will protect everything from our own oceans, to our forests, to our wildlife. Um, it allows us to address concerns about labor conditions, um, particularly in certain TPP countries, and you'll see quite a bit of improvements in, in that sense. Furthermore, it'll also be able to tackle a number of issues that have been addressed with trade packs, per se. But in the meantime, we are still moving forward with other um, countries outside of TPP, of course, the biggest being China. I come from in the State Department. It's a bureau called the Bureau of Energy Resources. It was created in 2011 under uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And um, because of the notion of understanding how energy is interconnected, and it certainly involves both the economics, the financing, uh, uh, looking at environmental issues, geopolitical issues, it's become more and more of a relevant issue today. Um, and to be able to focus all of those efforts from a diplomatic standpoint, uh, I think, was part of the notion of creating this bureau. So uh, when we think of energy, energy is the lifeline of our economies. And believe it or not, hydrocarbons will still be a major part of that future. Uh, I know we have a panel later today that will focus on green energy, which is tr tremendous and will be a good part of that, of that uh, energy mix. But for the purposes of today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the changing dynamics in, in energy here in the United States and how that's impacting Asia and what opportunities that could bring about for uh, joint ventures, for projects, and where we can go from there. But let me begin by... Uh, focusing on the U.S. Okay. <laughs> so here in the United States, it's an amazing time. As many of you have heard, we are experiencing this true global energy revolution, if anything. Um, in fact, there are five key factors here that I've listed on this slide that really focuses on what some of those geopolitical challenges are when you look at energy financing and poverty, when you look at supply and demand, uh, diversity of oil supply, uh, competition in natural gas, as well as looking at fuel mix and the impacts of climate change. So if you take a combination of technology innovation, entrepreneurship, strong commodity pricing, um, all of this has really spurred development in production of of areas such as shale oil, shale gas, as well as even offshore oil. So the way we focus on energy in Washington, and we look at it from three pillars as we define energy security. And that can be defined in many ways, but for purposes of today, uh, we look at how it's sustainable, how it's affordable, uh, reliability, as well as access to diverse energy supplies. Um, so the key notions here are managing the geopolitics of energy, working with consumer producer countries, 
stimulating the markets for energy transformation, and finally looking at transparency, governance, and access to energy. Uh, but for purposes of time, I want you to look at the second pillar, which I think is the most important right now when we look at how to be able to stimulate those markets for energy transformation. How do we evolve um, our basic understanding of, of promoting alternative energy, renewable energy, and yes, that does include nuclear uh, energy as well. Uh, so first, I think it's important to understand what is the global energy demand today. Um, I think it's no surprise here, though, that the, the forecast shows by 2040, China and India alone are going are expected to consume more energy than all of the non of the non OECD countries uh, that consume today. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, which is based in Paris, uh, estimates that non-OECD Asia, and this excludes, I'm sorry, excludes China, will have to spend $9 billion every year to 2030 just to meet their energy access goals. So the real question is, how do you accomplish this? And this has been key to some of our, our multilateral and bilateral uh, efforts uh, in Washington. So when you think about the rise of the standard of living, uh, how do you meet that, looking at those expectations that that are spurred by economic growth. Uh, Asian countries with low levels of access that are under increasing pressure to invest in power generation, for example. The global numbers of investment uh, that's required in the power sector are truly staggering today. And it, I think this will really provide a great opportunity for both the US and Asia to come together and partner on some of these projects. Okay, uh, real quickly, I, I wanted to put this slide up just to give you an idea. So yes, the US is going through this energy revolution. We're in this state of self-sufficiency, which has been tremendous uh, because of shale oil and shale gas. Well, in this era today of, of increased supply disruptions because of geopolitical events, I mean, I, I can't help but think about situations such as Libya in 2011, where uh, there has been an impact on, on oil supply and, and pricing. Um, the, one of the biggest questions that we get is, does the United States still care about peace and stability in regions such as the Middle East and elsewhere if we're doing so well here when it comes to the energy sector? Well, the answer is absolutely. Um, because oil and increasingly gas are global commodities and the U.S. pays global prices. Uh, so disruptions in those markets or in even maritime transit have a direct impact on the price we pay for energy and therefore our economic pr productivity. So it's, it, it, it certainly does hit um, in more than one uh, region of the world and will certainly have an impact on the supply for Asia. Right now, the United States and Canada are the only major producers that are commercially viable uh, for natural gas from shale formations in the world, um, even though there are about a dozen or so other countries right now that are conducting exploratory tests and so forth, uh, according to our Department of Energy. So the U.S. is actually ranked second after Russia uh, for shale oil um, and I think placed fourth after Algeria for shale gas resources if you compare it with another uh, about 41 other countries that have been assessed. Um, so increases in gas in the United States, though, are trying to be replicated ar around the world. But this just gives you an idea of what currently exists at this point in time on the shale basin. Uh, the age of gas and how uh, the approved reserves are certainly rising. So you're seeing a lot more coming online. Um, the EIA, the Energy Information Agency, different from the IEA, uh, is, which is part of the Department of Energy, uh, reported that there are 137 shale formations in 41 countries that are actually outside of the United States. Um, and with that, as technology improves and also data that improves, uh, so do the estimates of what actually becomes economic, economically viable. As I mentioned, shale formations, both in geology and above the ground conditions, uh, the extent to which is considered globally uh, technically recoverable shale resources will actually prove to be economically uh, recoverable. Um, but there's still a lot of um, unclear data that's coming in, uh, so we, we hope to see that as, as time progresses. Uh, this particular um, chart was based from June 2013. Um, so as I mentioned, U.S. gas production has driven our own 
sort of self-sufficiency, if you will. I hate to use the term energy independence because uh, at the end of the day, we are dependent on the markets and the markets are interconnected. So for purposes of today, I'll say self-sufficiency. But um, because of our gas production here in the US, it's increased about 25% over the last five years. Uh, but the bottom line here is these resources will mean that the US will become a net export of gas by the end of this decade, by 2020, which is tremendous actually means and why does Asia uh, why does Asia care well this also means lower uh, liquefied natural gas LNG uh, uh, prices because it means lower imports in the United States which makes it more available for the international markets so because of this gas revolution we're seeing about 80 BCM that's billion cubic meters of gas of liquefied natural gas um, that's available for other global markets particularly uh, looking at, at the Asia side of this and this has been reported since back in 2012 and this trend continues even today they're coming online, they're, they're accelerating movements uh, towards a more interconnected global market. So you have you know, the balance of high costs of transportation between re regions, which means there's not one single global gas price. Um, one thing I do want to highlight um, is if you look at Asia compared to Europe and, and the US, they pay the highest prices, unfortunately. OK, so what is Asia's role? We have a lot of emerging markets and, and demand is growing, as I mentioned earlier, and no surprise, China will be the principal factor in setting some of these prices when it comes to the global market. Uh, China's ability to satisfy its expanding demand um, could certainly influence that price, meaning its ability to satisfy that demand could certainly have a direct impact um, on the economic stability even here in the United States. And as I stated earlier, global commodities, uh, with regards to global commodities, the U.S. pays global prices for both oil and gas. So again, those disruptions in, in those markets will have a direct impact here uh, in the United States as you pay for, for various energy prices, as well as looking at economic productivity. Um, this next slide. Uh, just real quickly as a breakdown to show you some of the countries uh, where Asia gas demand is rising in the near term. And um, it's also broken down in sectors, too. So again, in non-OECD countries, you have gas consumption, for example, in the building sector, which is ex also expected to grow by 75% in, by 2020. Uh, again, China dominates this picture, accounting for almost half of the total of non-OECD uh, increases. You have urbanization. You have rising incomes, uh, which boost demand for water heating, for example, cooking, as well as space heating. Um, so a lot of these are the, are the main, main drivers. But uh, again, I, I, I come back to this question of what is this expected impact of maybe planned uh, gas hubs uh, on the Asia gas markets? So it's, it's certainly a challenge to answer. And, and if anybody has any comments about that, I, I certainly welcome that. But we do have a lot of market observers that are beginning to kind of consider this type of question if, if you can create a regional gas hub. that can, Again, we'll have to spend $9 billion every year to the year 2030 to meet their energy demand, as I mentioned before. So again, the question on how to accomplish this has been uh, a, a, more of an interagency question, I think, than anything. Um, so I think if we, if we look at this and we think about various initiatives, we heard earlier in some of the panels today, we have Power Africa and so forth, and I believe my OPIC colleague mentioned uh, this next um, initiative called the U.S. Asia Pacific Comprehensive Energy Partnership, or USASIP, since we like acronyms. Um, this has been something where we were able to uh, bring about $6 billion worth of commitments, five from XM and one from OPIC, which is tremendous, uh, where uh, the State Department's highest priority now has been to elevate this initiative. Um, it was announced um, a couple years ago as an economic initiative to underscore uh, the approach that the US and Asia uh, is looking to um, rebalance, if you will, uh, towards the region. And so, the partnership really is designed to try to bring more cleaner and renewable sources of energy to try to promote uh, uh, this type of access to the people of the Asia Pacific region. So just recently, USASIP marked its second and a half uh, year of, of trying to build on some of these projects. And we're starting to see some projects, especially in Singapore and Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and the Philippines when it comes to geothermal. So some of the, uh, one of the four major 
priorities within this initiative um, has been the emerging role of natural gas, which I just talked about a little bit. Uh, we also have partners, partnership with uh, Indonesia, for example, to co-host conferences with APEC, with ASEAN representatives to try to discuss more about the changing global gas markets, uh, unconventional gas, uh, as well as resource commercialization issues. And then we've had other events where we've worked with the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, uh, as well as uh, other offices within the State Department, um, and looking at gas trade missions to the United States uh, for countries uh, in the Asia Pacific region, and also working with the private sector. So to, to expand on some of the discussions and the challenges uh, that we've been able to identify and looking at it from a programmatic standpoint, if you will, we're, we're looking to uh, help more particularly in the gas region. And again, I know we're going to talk a little bit later on, on, on the green energy side of it. but. Uh, as I mentioned, trying to create some sort of gas hub will, will, I think will be, will be critical where you can focus on uh, the regulatory system uh, policies and investments behind the pricing um, and then have your focus on infrastructure. So decisions will, these type of decisions will, will certainly enhance the fuel competitiveness uh, to focus more on cleaner and more efficient resources throughout, throughout the region. Uh, one other thing I want to highlight with this initiative, uh, as I, again, we're, we're, we're infamous in Washington to come up with conferences and talk shops and initiatives here and there, but to be able to have the money, the commitments behind it is tremendous. But th at the end of the day, it does come down to identifying concrete projects. So um, I mentioned earlier we have a couple of geothermal projects. We've been working with the Indonesians as well as Philippines, but I think we're, we're, we're still looking and seeking ideas, especially from the private sector and others um, of where else we could probably use some of that money and that commitment towards these concrete projects. So I certainly welcome anybody to, to present some uh, uh, to me even offline where we're looking to expand upon that. So um, finally, what I'd like to close with is, uh, you know, here you have this transformation of U.S. supply. Uh, it's been able to reduce imports here, uh, which makes more oil and gas available to international markets, um, reducing the call on OPEC, uh, mitigating global uh, disruptions to the energy markets. Uh, for example, you think about Japan and the spike in demand that happened following the Fukushima emergency. So because oil and increasingly gas are, again, being uh, global commodities, I, I think the U.S. will maintain, uh, will continue to maintain a, an active role in trying to protect our global energy supplies. And in turn, I think this is going to spur great opportunity uh, for projects. And I think energy is, is, is a big one here, uh, given my line of work, uh, between Asia and the United States. So uh, with that, I will uh, close and turn it over to my colleague. Colleague George uh, from the White House as well to to discuss some of the initiatives, and uh, I look forward to your questions and comments afterwards. So thank you.